uh, welcome and uh, welcome back to our old friends and uh, alumni. Uh, I'm very happy to see you uh, today here celebrating uh, our program and our EP community. Um, welcome back. As you probably know, uh, this year uh, we are celebrating the centenary of Bartlett. Uh, so this alumni event is part of the Bartlett 100, as you can see from there. Um, I, will, I would like to give you a brief uh, outline of the event uh, today. So uh, we will have uh, uh, Professor Paul Eakins uh, uh, talking uh, about uh, a recent uh, news from uh, the Global Environment Outlook. Um, and after uh, questions and answers, we will uh, have some uh, alumni, Lina, uh, Ali, and Lionel. Uh, um, and we will uh, hear back uh, about their uh, experiences and uh, recent achievements. Um, before uh, uh, Paul, I would like to give you some information about the program and uh, how we are uh, performing. Uh, in the last years, uh, the interest uh, toward, uh, towards EPI has been uh, increasing uh, exponentially. Uh, as you can see from uh, our graph, uh, in 2018 uh, we needed to close recruitment two uh, months before expected. And this year we are around 100 applications uh, above that. So you can see as uh, the growth is uh, almost exponential from uh, 16, six, since uh, six, uh, 2016. Um, at the same time, uh, we are adapting, we are uh, evolving in some way. Uh, and we have introduced uh, some uh, new modules. This year we have introduced uh, behavioral economics and game theory uh, for the environment. And next year, uh, Julia Tomei and Jim Watson will uh, run uh, the new module, Energy Environment and Resources in Developing Countries. In the meantime, uh, our uh, students are uh, leaving uh, EP, are leaving our program and are doing great things uh, at national and international level. Uh, as you can see, uh, here we have uh, some uh, recent examples of uh, companies and organizations which are currently, or they have uh, hired uh, uh, our alumni from uh, UCL to uh, Carbon Trust uh, of GEM, uh, OECD, Aurora, and uh, uh, many others. Uh, at this point, uh, I would like to uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, Paul Eakins. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Paul Eakins for his uh, keynote speech. I think you have the slides in another file, right? So, yeah. Um, right. Thank you very much. It's really nice to see you all again. This is one of the uh, great pleasures, one of the great highlights of my year is to talk to you all again. And it would be such a pleasure that you're all doing so well and uh, helping to take forward uh, some kind of future for humanity, which is really nice. I'm going to talk today about this, which is yet another book stop. Um, it is the United Nations flagship report. Uh, they produce it every five or six years, so the last one was in 2012. So this is Geo 6, the sixth Global Environment Edition. There are real aficionados, if you look from Geo 1 to Geo 6, uh, you can become pretty suicidal. Because uh, it plots a course of systematic things getting worse. And uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on the, uh, on the bad data because there's lots of it in here, and you can find it. But I've had a rule for at least the last 10 years that when I do talks like this, I spend at least 60% talking about the solutions. 
uh, because it seems to me that's really what we need. I'm also going to talk a bit about the process because it's, uh, it's been a fascinating process to be co-chair of this um, of this activity, and um, here we go. It costs a lot of money, and so a lot of governments put up quite a bit of money. You will look in vain for the UK government, to my chagrin. It would be very nice if the UK government had been involved in that, but as you're probably aware, for the last couple of years, they've had other things on their mind. UN processes love photographs. So these are photographs of the authors, uh, of whom there were very many. Uh, it took 18 months. There were seven face-to-face -face meetings in different parts of the world, several of them funded by China. China is extraordinarily generous and effective in these kinds of global processes, which is really interesting. Good gender and geographical balance, uh, reviewed five times by researchers and governments, and a total of over 14,000 comments were addressed by the authors, of whom there were 146, 78 members of advisory bodies to uh, ensure the scientific uh, credibility of the process. Uh, two committees of quality assurance with 49 guys, 301 UN reviewers, and you can see the number of peer reviewers from around the world. So, a big process. And then we came in January to Nairobi for the negotiation of the summary for policymakers by government. And there they all are. Um, at the UN campus in Nairobi, uh, 95 countries. So we are seeing a growth in governmental interest uh, in these issues. UNEP before was kind of the preserve of Western Europe and the Nordic countries with um, developing countries coming when someone would pay for them. But you can see with 95 countries there, there was a lot of interest. And uh, that was the process over from February uh, through to earlier this year, that's February 2017 to earlier this year, with all these author meetings going on and the review periods, etc. Quite a logistical exercise. We hope it has scientific credibility, legitimacy. We hope it will have impact, and I'll talk a bit about that at the end. Synergy with other major global assessments, and there are lots of them, so there's the biodiversity assessment coming up. You'll all be aware that we had the IPCC 1.5 degrees report back in October. There was a global resources outlook launched at the same time from the International Resources Panel, a global waste outlook. And the messages from all these global assessments is kind of depressingly familiar, that people simply aren't doing enough. And increasingly, societies are being overwhelmed by the problems. Um, you can see the working structure there. Uh, the co-chairs had quite an important role in terms of trying to bring the authors together to uh, get some consistency in the narrative, uh, liaise with the governmental group, which included the US, which is always exciting in its current phase of development, um, and uh, produce the report. And on the uh, right of that, screen, you can see how the report is constructed. Um, I hope you will remember back to your course when we did the DPSIR indicator framework of analysis. Well, the report took that and applied it in great detail. So we had the driving forces, and that slide has actually missed out one of the driving forces at the top there. So it's economy, population, climate, technology, and there was also urbanization. Looked at the state and trends of the environment and it's pretty bad, uh, had 12 cross-cutting issues, which I'll talk about a bit in a minute, and then came down to the five great environmental themes, air, fresh water, oceans, land, biodiversity. One of the innovations was that the uh, previous United Nations Environment Assembly had asked that this report should concentrate on policy, which perhaps was why I was one of the two people who was asked to be a co-chair of it, because sections B and C were looking very much at what might be done. And I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. And then there was 
some projections into the future. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that the projections into the future of current trends mean that the Earth will be largely uninhabitable by the middle of this century. But uh, obviously it doesn't have to be like that, and that's what all the policy stuff was about. So that's what it's called, healthy planet, healthy people. And it was an absolutely uh, naked attempt to connect the environment, which unfortunately is still in many uh, government departments, a very low ranking government department, with a much higher ranking government department, which in most countries is the health department. And so we were at pains to draw out throughout the report the impacts of the environment on health. And it won't surprise you to learn that those impacts and relationships are incredibly close. So the way that this is now being framed in the international arena, in the biodiversity report and elsewhere, is in terms of nature's contributions to humans. And nature, obviously, is the foundation of all of human life, human economy. I'm always quite amused by that uh, paper by Bob Costanza, which we probably covered in the course, that suggests that um, the value of global ecosystem goods and services is $125 trillion. I've no idea what that means. Um, but it suggests that if someone was even richer than uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, and could come along with $125 trillion, we'd all say, oh, yes, please, take all our ecosystem goods and services and give, them, give us these dollars. And we're not quite sure what we would do with the dollars when we didn't have any ecosystem goods and services. But that's you know, part of the philosophical uh, problems around some of these valuation issues. Uh, much more serious is the fact that 70% of the world's population depends absolutely directly on these ecosystem goods and services. And these are the guys who are dying at the moment, obviously, not us, uh, but they are um, increasingly. Um, and as I've said, it underpins everything. Um, environmental, uh, I didn't know this statistic at all, but environmental factors cause 25% of all deaths on the planet. Uh, they're all avoidable. Um, we all know we're going to die of something at some point, but those are people dying early because of what we do. Air pollution itself is 7 million deaths. And, and that number, when a few of the media interviews that I did, and I was asked, you know, inevitably, you're probably aware that this UN Environment Assembly in Nairobi was very much marred by uh, an airline crash uh, a few days before, which killed 157 people, including about 50 delegates who had been coming to Nairobi to take part. And obviously, everyone was very sad about this. It was very tragic. And we, lit candles and um, had moments of silence, etc. Um, but air pollution kills 20,000 people a day. 20,000 people a day. And it's completely avoidable. We know what to do. Many countries have done it, and we choose not to do it. Water pollution, loss of biodiversity, you can read all that stuff. I mean, this is really serious. This is the beginning of the unraveling of human societies. Uh, in the face of uh, real environmental stress. Um, so we then, in the report, we look in great detail at these drivers, pressures, states, and impacts. I'm going to skip over these because you'll know population, urbanization, growth, technology, and climate change. I've mentioned those already. Um, and the kinds of policies we've also, you're also be pretty well aware of about how we can address some of these issues. There were lots of cross-cutting issues, and, and one of the things which I hope the course does is stress the systemic nature of these problems. But it's absolutely useless to imagine you're going to solve them by focusing on particular government departments in silos. So there we have the cross-cutting issues, of which there are 12. We group them as people and livelihoods, changing environments, and resources and materials. And uh, again, there's lots and lots of data there. Uh, I hope that a few people, apart from PhD students in ISR, will read GEO6, but it's obviously quite a, um, quite a, big, a big call. So there's the state of an unhealthy planet. It's not good. 
And again, I'm thinking of uh, the cyclone that hit Mozambique just recently, uh, and 100 people we know are killed and another thousand missing or something, and uh, welcome to the future. Um, impacts of an unhealthy planet, so that's going through the DPS I. And then my fellow co-chair, who's uh, a woman of Indian extraction called Joyita Gupta, who now works at the University of Amsterdam, she came up with this marvelous picture, which I think is very resonant, looking at two, uh, the two lines along the bottom, planetary impact and human health impact, the planetary impact looking from good to ir irreversible, negative impacts and human health impacts going from low to very high. And then, most importantly for me, the uh, dotted lines, because the dotted lines are intended to get across the fact that these average impacts don't tell the story. Uh, that these impacts are spread extraordinarily unequally around the world. And they are far, far higher for poor and vulnerable people. Um, and so that's what the dotted lines are intended to express. So there we are. That's my 40% of doom and gloom. And uh, we're going to come now to the 60% of what we could do about it if we felt so inclined. Um, uh, there was uh, The whole of Part B was about policy effectiveness analysis. What do we do about it and, and how do we know when what we're doing is effective? And I, th I think the global legislators at the UN Environment Assembly were hoping that the answer would be, we know lots and there are a few magic bullets and when we do this, that and that, we can solve this problem just like that. And unfortunately, that's not the case. The great majority of policies are not evaluated at all. So actually, it's very difficult to learn from the policy experience we've had. And so the report goes through a policy effectiveness analysis carried out for air, biodiversity, oceans, land and soil, fresh water, uh, and then looks in particular at those three great life-preserving systems, energy systems, food systems, and the circular economy, which is the way we treat materials, especially at the end of their life. You'll see a box there called case studies. We did five case studies for each of the uh, environmental themes from different parts of the world. Things that uh, the authors felt had worked to some extent and had lessons to learn from. And actually, that's a very positive part of the report, because although it's not possible to draw general conclusions about policies that can be applied everywhere with certain success, it is extraordinary how much has been experimented with and innovated with over the last 20, 30 years, and uh, how much has worked to at least some extent. So the theme of this year's UN Environment Assembly was innovation. So we'll be very pleased about that. Um, and so there was a lot of chat about innovation, but obviously not just technical innovation, also policy innovation, mix of invention, diffusion, and the monitoring of effects. Um, often evaluation comes down to expert judgment because people haven't set it up in such a way that you can do a formal evaluation. Um, absolutely key lesson which we tried to put across as hard as we could to the environmental ministers who were there at the assembly, but you can't do it with environmental ministries alone. It has to be cross-sectoral. You've got to do agriculture and transport and energy and all that as well. So that's pretty important. And if you do that, there's plenty of scope for co-benefits. So that was another thing that is quite, um, uh, quite heartening. The importance of good policy design, so really how the, how the policy is crafted is absolutely uh, imperative and the involvement of stakeholders in policy design. So it was, was really interesting that many of the themes that come up in the discussions that we have in this course um, were there in spades and were brought together from all these academics and other scientists from all over the world in order to 
deal with that. Uh, some thought about the policy cycle, so this comes from, uh, actually comes from the report. Uh, the enormous importance, there are two chapters in um, GEO6 on data information and knowledge, and UNEP is very much trying to position itself as part of big data analytics, and that's one of the areas where I think there's enormous promise for the future. Um, they've entered into what could easily be a, a slightly fraught relationship with Google. Uh, I mean, you've kind of got to enter a relationship with people like that if you're wanting really to do serious big data analytics from Earth observation and all this other kind of stuff. But the guy from Google was, well, just like you'd expect a guy from Google to be, really, um, sort of incredibly smart and young and saying how much public good there was in Google, but of course they were a profit-making company, really. And it was, it was fascinating, cross messages going across the whole time, but that was very interesting. So, some illustrative results of the policy evaluations that came up there. Uh, don't forget traditional regulation. They've worked in many parts of the world. Uh, biodiversity, really interesting ideas about the green economy where you hadn't thought perhaps biodiversity would be the first thing that came out of the green economy. Um, oceans and fish, uh, land and soil, uh, fresh water, and then, as I say, these systemic policy approaches. So the conclusions from, I guess, what must be about 250 pages in there, um, consider policy effectiveness in the design of policy, establish a baseline, Conduct cost-benefit, cost-effectiveness cost analysis exactly as you're taught to do in EP. Ensure policy coherence and synergy so that you're looking across other departments and you're not working against each other. Conduct these evaluation studies, engage key actors, uh, and find the right indicators. So then we come on to outlooks. Um, and... Uh, well, that, in a way, was the most depressing part of it. The people who carried out this part of the work were absolutely top-notch people from PBL in the Netherlands, the um, uh, scientific and environmental office there, uh, who, who do a lot of integrated assessment. Uh, and it's quite clear that we're not going to hit the SDGs or come anywhere near them. We're not going to hit any of the environmental-related uh, targets in the SDGs, the multilateral environmental goals, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, I've put classic British understatement, this is not the future we want. And that, of course, is a reference to the Agenda 2030 of the United Nations, which was entitled The Future We Want. And uh, it's absolutely clear that we're not anywhere near uh, achieving that. Um, just a few slides then on the big systems, the energy system, um, the food system and waste and circularity and some slides that show that uh, we, we have to achieve all sorts of contortions in order to bring ourselves back on track. So those are the chapters in part C where we're looking at, at the outlooks. Chapter 23 is really interesting. Again, it's the first time that a scientific report of this kind has really looked at civil society initiatives um, across the piece in order to try to identify how top-down policy and bottom-up civil action might meet in the middle in order to get greater effectiveness. Um, so this is one of the contortions. We know energy demand is going to increase dramatically, uh, 50 to 60 percent according to these projections. We know that we've got to uh, decrease fossil fuels by 80% by 2050, reach net zero shortly thereafter. Um, and there are actions, therefore, that need to follow from that, and we try to go through those in uh, some detail. Food, similarly, we know that there are going to be another couple of billion people living on the planet in 30-odd um, uh, years, uh, and uh, barring catastrophe, of course. Um, so we need at least 50% more food. Um, we know that the environmental impact of agriculture is colossal. One of the great contortions that happened during the governmental negotiations was the uh, ministers from uh, the great agriculture uh, countries, particularly Brazil and Argentina, um, pretending 
or denying that agriculture was a problem in, term, in environmental terms, in terms of biodiversity. All the data is absolutely clear that the way we produce food today is completely unsustainable. But it's, a, it's amazing when that's an inconvenient truth, uh, the contortions that people will get into uh, to argue against that. Lots of things we can do about food as well. And then, of course, waste and circularity. A um, lot of attention at the, uh, at the assembly itself on plastics, as you can imagine. They're kind of not exactly the flavor of the month, but uh, you know what I mean. They've got a, a high profile. Uh, it's clear volumes of waste are going to rise as the consumer society takes hold in more and more countries. Um, but it's equally clear that the environmental impact from that has got to uh, reduce dramatically. So then we come to the part of the, of the report that I really like most, which is uh, how we can get off the track we're on and how we can get onto the track that we need to be on in order to get to a 2030 and 2050 target that is, uh, uh, is more desirable. And again, there's lots of positive things to be said. Uh, the pathways exist. Uh, they will require all three of technological improvements, lifestyle change, and localized solutions. Um, any one of those that's missing is likely to stymie the other two. Um, we can eliminate hunger, prevent biodiversity loss, do all these great things that are in the sustainable development goals. Um, we can just about reduce greenhouse gas emissions to levels consistent with the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, air pollution emissions obviously can be reduced dramatically. Global water stress similarly. Um, and then, uh, again, stressing the integration point. And the nice thing about the SDGs is when you look at them across, when you look across them at the, uh, as a whole, there are more synergies between them than trade-offs. So there are some cases where if you uh, pursue one, you have to be very careful that you don't have negative impact on the other, but there are lots of cases where if you pursue one, you can have positive impacts on the other ones. So chapter 23 is great because there is a groundswell of bottom-up efforts to realize the SDGs around the world. Um, but it will require transformation, and, and that's a pretty tough message for politicians to hear um, because people don't really like transformations, uh, and politicians hate them. Uh, politicians like things to go on the way they understand them. But we know what kinds of transformations are required, and so you've got your little five-point checklist there. And then, obviously, from an economics point of view, I love that last number, which comes from a paper published by Anil Makandia, that if you take the global health savings into account, you've got a benefit-cost ratio of more than two um, in actually doing this stuff. So that has to be worthwhile. Um, there's the uh, link for the report itself and I just want to say one or two words really about the process of the UN Environment Assembly because I'd never been at one of these big um, UN bashes before. I mean, Michael, you've probably been at the IPCC report so you've kind of seen this stuff in action. Um, the US came and unfortunately the, U the, you know, the UNEP delegation in Nairobi uh, had passed it back to the State Department, and we'd hoped it was going to stay at the State Department, but it didn't. It went up to the White House. And that's kind of interesting. You can imagine the White House not terribly impressed with the global environment outlook. So the US came with a resolution which basically said, we note GEO6, note, you notice. And now what about GEO7? So that all of us having thought that between GEO6 and GEO7 there needed to be something called transformative action. Sort of wondering what's going on here. The delegates then spent the best part of two weeks arguing about these resolutions. And eventually 25 resolutions were passed, and you can find those on the web. And the really good news was that that resolution about GEO6, instead of just noting it and passing on to GEO7, that resolution ended up saying, we endorse 
the science policy interface, which is kind of what Geo6 is supposed to be. And we welcome with appreciation Geo6. So that a bunch of very highly paid and very skilled policymakers, 193 of them, spent two weeks changing that resolution from we note and now give us Geo7 to we welcome and all that. So that's quite depressing. Um, <laughs> but one of the really good things about that process, which probably wouldn't have happened if the United States had come in a less uh, combative frame of mind, was that there was real arguments about these resolutions. And the guys who paid for GO6 and the developing countries who are currently being slaughtered by what's going on in the natural environment in their country started banging the table and saying, we love GO6. GO6 is absolutely fantastic, and we want it to be implemented to the last degree. So they had a big argument about it, and the United States was forced to shift slightly. Um, but what it meant was that there was a much more positive attitude in the arena uh, than there had been at the beginning. And I think the last thing I'll say is, because it's the kind of, I'm not a diplomat, as you will have noticed, um, and so I don't really understand diplomacy. But, but what I do understand is that the US really is in a bad place at the moment, diplomatically speaking. Because out of, uh, as we came to the end of this meeting, and, and uh, sort of small people like myself weren't allowed to attend the negotiations, obviously because I'm not a government person, um, but we were allowed into the final plenary. Um, and the whole mood of the place was that they'd work through this, these 25 resolutions, they passed these 25 re resolutions, they felt they'd done a decent job of work, they wanted to celebrate, they felt there was some momentum going, and so there were lots of clapping and stuff. And on two occasions, the United States made interventions that can only be described as profoundly unhelpful. <laughs> and it was really interesting but, but all the other countries, when they made interventions that were saying, yeah, we love this resolution because it's great, there was huge applause and absolutely fantastic. So when the US spoke, no one said, clapped. It was absolutely dead silence. I kind of wondered what that must do to those guys sitting there and, and doing that. Because uh, they sacrificed at least 10 years' worth of soft power in that meeting. And of course, the huge beneficiary of all that was China, because China was there. China was amazingly positive. China was with all the G77. China was pushing this resolution, pushing that resolution, engaging in these negotiations. So you kind of got this feeling of one superpower just taking themselves away and another superpower coming in and filling up the space. And that was a really kind of interesting, interesting feeling. And um, I just can't understand what the US is playing at. So there we are. Some questions, please. Which government is not prepared at all to consider that. 
And my, my great fear is that in its current mood, the United States will switch very quickly from climate denialism to geoengineering without there being any kind of uh, any kind of global process. And obviously geoengineering uh, runs the risk of having very negative impacts on the source of energy. So yeah, I, I mean the hope is that um, the governments will have been suitably impressed by the proceedings. I think your environment took a huge risk because the final day of the assembly was last Friday. And last Friday, you will remember, was the day of the student strike. Um, and there were lots of Kenyan students outside the gates of the compound of the UN, shouting to get on with it. And one of the speakers at that final plenary was a 17-year-old German woman. And she really laid it down. You know, it's your responsibility, that is our future, and you're screwing us up. Get off your bus, get out of your cars, and do what needs to be done. So it was really very, really pointed, personal stuff. I was looking around and people were a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> Not used to being spoken to like that by young people in these august, uh, august <coughs> surroundings. So will that make a difference? I don't know. But, but I did think perhaps, just perhaps, we may be approaching to people where people will actually think, oh, you know, we need, we need to go way beyond our current plans and strategies, which is obviously what the South is the But so, yeah, just on that, are you, again, are you concerned at this stage where we're approaching the point where we couldn't use the making concessions, or we're missing a lot of deadlines, and we're getting used to, to shifting the goal post to something that's actually achievable? Um, are we getting a Yeah, I mean, obviously the problem with geoengineering is that we have no idea what the impacts are going to be. So it's uh, simply isn't there. But, but there could easily become suddenly a desire, you know, we must do something. Politicians sometimes get the urge, we must do something. And if doing something means, you know, shooting rockets up in the sky in the form of solving particles, I mean, that's the kind of thing that a certain kind of media likes to do. Because they have understanding that it's actually you know, kind of virgin which of and stuff, um, which we deserve. Whereas this environmental policy is much less, much less than that. Um, on, on the targets, um, yeah, I mean, we're certainly not taking the targets in the set seriously. Uh, in addition to the geo uh, presentation that we made last Wednesday, there was Bob Watson. Former Chief Scientific Advisor of DEFRA, who's chairing the uh, Biodiversity Report, which will be published in May, I think. And uh, he was really strong because there were the Aichi targets set for 2020, <coughs> and not a long time away. And the great majority of them are absolutely no way to achieve, no way to achieve. And um, so there is a big danger that now they're going to enter another target setting process for 2030. But how do we know that we're going to take this time to be serious in the time So that is obviously very yeah. yeah. uh, Good question. The first, it is very much my research. Uh, did you consider this report uh, integration uh, within the energy union, or is it only in the energy union? So within energy, maybe like uh, demand of power, gas, and transport. Second question, uh, what was the stand of the UK in those uh, negotiations? I hear they are doing very well in terms of carbon targets, so they should be supported. Yeah, the UK is generally pretty positive. And, I mean, I spoke to the UK delegates who were there, and as with everyone, definitely they were very nice. <laughs> and uh, uh, they're pretty committed. But it's perfectly clear that their mind was not on that. There were no UK ministers there. And a hundred ministers came to the meeting, but no one could be there. Because they didn't vote in the House of Commons on the various parts that have been concerned about the last few weeks. So, so the UK 
they would normally, I think, be more positive. They didn't say anything that I had in the session. Um, on the energy stuff, I mean, although this is a long book, um, the Global Energy Assessment is every bit as long as this. In fact, it's quite a bit longer. The Global Energy Assessment, I think, is 1,100 pages. And that really goes into the integration of the energy system. So if you're looking for really real detail on energy, you wouldn't pick this up. This has the broad sweep of what needs to be done. So we know we have to decarbonize the power system, we know we have to move towards electric vehicles, we know all that kind of stuff, and you will know all that from having done this course. Uh, and there are some high level numbers about that, but uh, I'm sure that you will find it unsatisfying in your own energy, uh, specialized energy stuff. Yeah. Hi, um, I work as an analyst in Denver, um, and my question relates to environmental targets. Yeah. So you said that the balance of those often get missed. Um, does the report look into that? And specifically, does it look at long term media environment targets and how they can be designed to encourage policy innovation and transformation? Yeah, transformation. Okay. Uh, it does look into that a bit. One of the case studies I was pleased to see in the report, because obviously I know parts in choosing it. One of the case studies in the report is the UK Climate Change Act, which I think is generally perceived to be as good as you can get in terms of not only setting a long-term target, that's easy, but setting the processes whereby governments have their feet put to the fire so that they will actually meet the target. And although it's still not clear that we're going to meet the fourth and fifth carbon budgets, um, uh, the Committee on Climate Change is making it clear that there needs to be more policy and government has to respond to that, you know, all as set out in the Climate Change Act. So I think there is a lot of thought about it, uh, a lot of thought about that. And, um, and obviously the Paris Agreement targets have been a huge subject of lots of research and, and um, you know, the emissions gap report from the UN Environment Programme to uh, show that countries aren't doing really enough and all this kind of stuff. So, I'm a great target man. I think targets are really important. And in fact, part of the work I'm hoping to do with the UN over the next few years is on science based targets um, in, in that respect. But uh, yeah, they're helpful. Yes. Uh, well, how do you see the impact of uh, all those, the US was there stepping out and trying to come in here? But I believe that we need a systemic concision between nations to do this in a global perspective. So how do you see the impact of this uh, nationalist wave that we are seeing around the world that is starting with Trump and uh, Brazil is facing this nowadays where the development is above everything so it doesn't matter the environment now, it's not our priority and how this can impact in five years for geo for example, uh, how we can deal with this in the short term? Yeah, in the short term I don't know. I'm, I'm neither a I'm certainly not a diplomat, I'm also not a politician, but like you, I share a concern. Because again, all the analysis that we do shows that we need more multilateral cooperation <coughs> and not less. And that any notion that any single country would go off and pack the stuff by themselves is complete illusion. Um, and so it is extremely worrying that that perception is not more generally shared by the people who, who vote. Um, and that, you know, you should, you know, that an awful slogan like make America great again, America first, and all that kind of stuff, is absolutely not what America needs, actually. What America needs in a globalized world. Um, it is certain to make America poorer and um, less influential in the world. And I think Brazil will find exactly the same. If they, if they seem to go down the same route. I have to say, the Brazilian diplomat there was fantastic. He chaired something called the Committee of the Whole, which when apparently these assemblies when they had a real problem with resolutions, and they had lots of problems with resolutions this time. These resolutions had given to this body called the Committee of the Whole, and he was chairing that. And when he came back and the he made the most amazing presentation about how the Committee of the Whole considered these resolutions and had, without exception, resolutions that had been submitted to it. 
come back with resolutions for consideration that I understand it to pass, and they were all passed. And the way he presented it, you kind of got the feeling you have to be a very brave person indeed to get it. I was looking at the US, thinking, the US may say, you know, no, don't want to do this, but it didn't. And so they went through. So, I mean, Brazil is still playing a very positive role in these multinational forum. Um, obviously, it's a very important country. Uh, very much hope that he continues to do that. Uh, Paul, is that hole spelled with a W? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. It is. It is. It's, it's not a committee of the hole. It's not things that go into a hole. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they, the hole. they did go into a hole. It was a W-H-O-A, absolutely. Yes. I, I've never heard that phrase before. There's so many things you hear. Like, they're not part of this process. You hear things and you've never heard them before. But we saw that. Yeah. Um, was there any consideration to the distribution of these responsibilities and these goals amongst the states, like who should be more responsible for how you can distribute these goals amongst the states? No, I mean that's a really interesting, a really interesting question. And um, that <coughs> kind of discussion, as you can imagine, is really sensitive. And the kind of formulation that they have as as in the framework I mentioned, common differentiated responsibilities, no one ever really digs down into that and says, well, okay, well, what does that mean? What does it mean you're going to do? What does it mean I'm going to do? Right? And let's bottom that out. I mean, on some of the targets, like the you Aichi know, targets, they're very much national responsibilities. Biodiversity, by definition, is located within a particular territory that is under someone's jurisdiction, or it's in the global commons, um, which is supposed to be subject to some kind of global multilateral jurisdiction. But, but you're absolutely right, people tend to tip to those sorts of distributions. Yeah. You mentioned that the report covers ways to integrate top-down policy decisions and bottom-up participatory uh, work, and I just wanted to expand on that and suggest as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very early days, and it's very early days to know whether it's going to work. And although I was quite positive about this grants for bottom-up initiatives, when you look at them in the scale of both the problems and the necessary solutions, they don't really add up to the world beings. Um, so, you know, there's an enormous issue, and, and the people who work on these things, they're always talking about scaling. You know, how are we going to scale this? Because, you know, you've got three men and a dog down here doing fantastic stuff. Um, but, actually, you know, there's nine billion of us. Involved in this in some way. So it's um, uh, that's that's part of the narrative, I think, which is still more uh, more hope than experience. Uh, but there is stuff there to work with, and the whole kind of stakeholder impulse is obviously a very important one. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Very much. Thank you, and uh, um, yeah, I think they're here. Yeah. Uh, now uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you uh, some of our uh, alumni from EP. Uh, we have uh, uh, Lina, Ali, and Lionel, which uh, will uh, discuss with us about their experiences. Uh, yeah, I think you can maybe sit here, but, or you prefer to stay. Oh. Okay, that's good. You decide. Uh, okay, yeah. So I think the order is you, Ali, and okay. uh, Yeah. Is your microphone working? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And then, in, sorry, in the end of the presentations, we will have uh, a bit of space for questions and answers again. Okay, so um, thank you for having me here. I'm pretty excited to be here to talk about my experiences with the EPI program. So uh, my name is Lena. A bit of background about me. Um, I finished my Bachelor of Science in Foreign Service and International Economics from Georgetown University in 2015. And then after that, for two years, I worked in the Middle East on, uh, with some startups, and I did some consulting with the government as well during that time. 
Um, and in this region, as many of you know, energy is kind of a, a quintessential part of the economy, and that's kind of where I got interested in the industry. So I was looking for a program that not only would tell me about the energy industry historically, but also tell me where it was going. Um, and that's kind of why I chose the EPI program. So I finished that in 2018, and now I work with BP um, as of September 2018. I got into their low carbon graduate program. So this involves three rotations over three years. The first one, which I'm currently in, is with Global Environmental Products. Um, and this department is within integrated supply and training and trading. And this involves trading environmental products such as carbon offsets and um, emissions allowances around the world, and most notably in California. Um, the second rotation will involve uh, will be with alternative energy, which will involve project management and delivery of um, alternative energy projects, and also increasing their portfolio of um, clean energy. And finally, the last year will be with BP Ventures, which is basically um, uh, investing in new technology, new technologies um, related. So, a little bit about my EPI experience. Um, so, I decided to uh, take the module on modeling because I have an interest in data and I think it's a very useful skill to have as an economist. And I think the most impactful course that um, has kind of led me to my career choice is the measurement course with Paula Eakins and Ben Milligan. So, this course kind of made me interested in how international policy, uh, most notably the Paris Agreement, has, has been able to shape domestic policy and domestic compliance markets around the world. Um, and perhaps that's, you know, kind of informed my dissertation su subject, and I did my dissertation basically on um, the use and um, the use of energy tokens uh, on the blockchain um, and as um, as a, mean, as a vehicle for climate finance and energy product trading. So um, overall, how did this course influence my career path? I think that the degree is quite, it differentiates you as an applicant when you're applying for jobs. Um, and that's very good because this sector is very, very competitive. Anyone who wants to work for energy wants to work for clean energy. No one really wants to work for coal or oil and gas or anything like that. So it's, it's very good to have this differentiating factor when applying for jobs. And I think the course also introduce you to, introduces you to a lot of different perspectives. So, um, and from that can arise a lot of career paths. So that can be law, it can be carbon accounting, it can be policy. There's, you know, a plethora of of uh, career paths out there. Um, and I think this, this degree really does open the doors for you in that respect. Overall, um, I think you know the, the degree gives me this great foundation, but it's ultimately up to the individual to decide what, what they want to specialize in. And from there, they can pursue it as a career. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you can sit here for So, oh, yeah. um. <laughs> hi, I'm Ali. I was on the EPI course last year with Lena. Um, and yeah, since finishing in the summer, um, I went to Geneva for three months to do an internship at UN Environment, um, where I was on a team called the Partnership for Action on the Green Economy. Um, and they were, they were actually five UN agencies that joined together, and the UN Environment was one of them. Um, and they worked with, they partnered with developing countries around the world um, to help develop and implement sustainable economic policy. Um, yeah, I was kind of on the, I was on the secretariat, which was kind of like a facilitating, coordinating role. Um, but then after that, I started as a research assistant working for Michael um, back at the ISR in December. Um, and I've been working on various different things. Um, one of the main things I've been working on is a project that's just started recently on um, how policies can induce innovation in energy technologies. Um, and this has kind of come about, come about in part because the IPCC is in the process of producing its next um, assessment report. Um, and because of the like, exponential growth in climate literature, um, they, they put out a call for people to publish um, systematic reviews on evidence, um, which basically allows them to look at kind of the most 
um, relevant evidence um, in a given area. Yeah, taking away the biases. And I put this article in with that funny Trump mask <laughs> um, because, yeah, I was reading that article this morning and it said that um, the amount of climate literature that will have to be reviewed in the next IPCC report is about 300,000 papers, which is substantially larger than all the climate literature that existed before 2014. Um, so yeah, they're kind of looking at ways in which they can kind of capture more of that. Um, but sort of more generally, it's looking to address um, the kind of gap in approach to innovation, um, where on the one hand, um, there's a school of, sort of thought that sort of says if you fix the market failures and fund R and D, then the kind of the market will decide on the best way to, um, the, yeah, the, the optimal way to for firms to innovate. But then there's lots of other more diverse literature um, that looks at how policies and different market-related exposures influence innovation in loads of different ways, um, which has an implication for obviously the policies that governments choose to employ, but also how we model them as well. Um, apart from that project, um, I'm working with Michael on a number of other things, um, one of which is possibly updating the Planetary Economics book, which was a textbook. Um, and also trying to engage more of the mainstream economics literature um, in this kind of thinking as well. Um, so yeah, after I finish at, um, at UCL, I'll be starting a graduate climate change consulting job at Arab, um, in the autumn. Um, yeah. Oh no, that's not it yet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's the start at the end. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of what I've done since the course. Um, now I'll talk about my experience of the course and how it helped me. <laughs> um, so yeah, my initial impressions of the course, so I came straight from a chemical engineering degree um, to this master's. Um, so yeah, I was thinking back to my initial impressions. And yeah, I became really used to lectures sort of being a lot about like <laughs> pipes and reactors and um, yeah, fluid, like calculating how fluid flows through pipes and stuff, um, which yeah, was great, but not the most exciting thing to talk about. Um, so yeah, my initial impressions of the course were like, wow, this is like, this is what lectures are like, yeah, it's a kind of a whole new experience of what lectures were like, um, actually kind of interesting to talk about afterwards, which was nice. <laughs> um, overall, yeah, my impressions of the course was, yeah, I think with courses, interdisciplinary courses like this, it's always going to be a balance between breadth and depth. Um, and I think that this course did that really well. I think it kind of provided an entrance point into like a lot of the most relevant, um, yeah, the most relevant aspects of the current climate change debate. Um, and thinking back now that now when I sort of accumulate knowledge, I think it provided quite a good foundation that I'm able to sort of like slot things into into place. I think it covered quite a lot of ground. And um, actually, I found this when I was at the UN. There was quite a lot of other interns at UN Environment who had come from London courses. Um, masters like doing really similar things like LSE and Imperial and stuff um, which is actually quite a whole other issue in itself <laughs> it's really London centric um, but yeah it, we obviously like compared our courses a lot and it made me realise like just how sort of broad um, yet relevant this course was which was nice um, key benefits and highlights yeah so again coming from more of a quantitative background um, one of the main benefits for me was learning more qualitative skills um, and I ended up doing my dissertation, um, a qualitative dissertation on looking at the policies and regulations for decentralised renewable mini-grids um, in developing countries. Um, and yeah, I think it's nice that people kind of get really different things out of the course and come in with, it, come in with different skills and come out with different um, th things gained, yeah. Um, but yeah, actually one of the biggest highlights was meeting people from all around the world who were kind of interested in similar things and talking about the things that we just learned about and hearing about how it's kind of processed and digested from other perspectives. Um, I think that was really valuable. And now I've got a really nice network of people who are interested in diff are the same thing as me around the world. And yeah, I put in this photo of um, this brown field because <laughs> um, some of us went camping last summer. <laughs> And we were expecting, 
we're expecting to go through like um, lovely walks of like meadows and green fields, and then realise the whole UK had turned brown <laughs> because of the heat wave. So yeah, that felt like quite a fitting end to the course. Um, <laughs> So how the course has helped me, yeah, so working back at ISR as a research assistant with Michael, it's probably more obvious than for most, yeah, more directly obvious than for most people how the course has influenced my current position. Um, but generally, I have had so much, so much better um, luck with job applications and stuff since doing the course. Um, and the best example of that is probably to talk about Arup. Um, I actually applied for the exact same position a year before didn't even get past the first round, um, applied again, and yeah, got, ended up getting the job, so the only thing that changed was doing the masters, so hopefully it has some influence. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a respected title, but also I've definitely found throughout the application processes that I was able to apply the knowledge and stuff that I'd learnt. So yeah, those are my experiences of the course. Um, yeah, feel free to email me or chat to me afterwards. Any more questions? Thank you, Lionel. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Lionel, class of 2015. Used to be an oil and gas journalist uh, before taking the EGE course. And I was based in Dubai, so like Lena, sort of got an exposure to how the energy sector is very pervasive in everything we do sparked my interest and enrolled, got in. After graduating, I worked at the World Bank for a couple of years, and I now work at Climate Models Initiative. It is a NGO based in London that is basically trying to deal with the issues we're all passionate about by mobilizing debt market capital towards climate change solutions. We do that by setting science-based targets to help develop a climate bond standard against which a bond issuer can certify their issued bond. Uh, that allows us to build a market for green bonds, which is actually only 10% of this. this is, uh, we certify a certain percentage of this market. This is the total market of green bonds issued over the last couple of years. As you can see, it's grown quite substantially, although in the last, between 2017 and 18, there was an overall sort of slowdown in bond issuance across the economy, and we're seeing that with green bond issues as well. Ultimately, our goal is uh, to deal with policy and to build the policy frameworks for both the issuers, so the real, real economy, but also for the financial sector to become more entrenched in investing in climate change solutions in some way or the other. We often talk about policy cycles and those deal with maybe the building sector or the transport sector, but we often neglect the financial sector, right? And these are the folks who the investment, the institutional investors have trillions of dollars they need to park, park it somewhere. And with their sort of post-financial crisis mandates, a lot of this goes towards sustainability financing. That's a little bit about what I do. Um, in terms of learning from this course and also how it's helped me with my career, I put that in the context of, again, what we're doing at CBI. Essentially, as I mentioned, we're building science-based criteria against different sectors uh, so that we can certify bond issuance. Blue ticks are the ones that we have criteria for. The, well, I'm actually the line, so I think the orange ones are the ones that are under development, and the gray ones are who commence. Essentially, we go sector by sector, trying to set different science-based targets. I'm currently working on the shipping sector, so our goal there is to figure out how do we decarbonize freight shipping between now and 2050. Uh, the way we do it is basically look at emissions, ton, uh, emissions per tonnage mile, and we want that number to go down from whatever it is now, to zero by 2050. And we do that across sectors with the goal of eventually influencing policymakers at a much wider level. Uh, so we're doing that with the European Union and through the European Commission, their Sustainable Finance Initiative. Essentially, we're helping to build a taxonomy on different sectors and what is green and what is not green. So it gets kind of tricky because we're dealing with things like nuclear, uh, CCS, hydrogen, and when and if you would consider those things green. Uh, I think that's really goes from based, it's based on your principles, but then also the thresholds that you use to reflect the principles that you start off with. Um, and obviously, I mean, the Geo6 report is an example of how 
there's a lot of ways to look at our natural capital, climate change, or a wider environmental scale. And so being in this program really helped to set that sort of context and discourse for me to be able to go into these different sectors and understand what the main issues are that we're trying to deal with. Uh, I'd say that was the biggest sort of contextual and content-driven benefit of this program. Other than that, I'd say that the contacts that we sort of build from being in a program like this are extremely useful. Uh, so for the shipping sector, what I'm working on, for example, we recently hired Tristan Smith and Sophie Parker from UCL. They, live, they work upstairs. They don't live upstairs. They work upstairs. Um, and they work for a, co a consultancy called Matrans, which is basically the shipping-focused research institute within UCL. Um, and so we've hired them to help us build those criteria. And I would not have been able to find them if I had not spoken to Will when I first moved back to London five months ago. Uh, and he introduced me. Oh, he, he let me know about like Tristan and Sophie. So through that, I was able to get my work done. Uh, I've also built some great friends over time, like you know, Lucas, Shai, Dan, Julia. So everyone's here, which is nice. Um, yeah. That was my experience. I think, oh, I was, I was meant to add, talk about one memorable experience. And I think, for me, it was, you know, in the old, uh, the old Bartlett Institute in the basement, you have all those study rooms. I think at the end of the year, when everyone's cramming and like you've got you know, 12, 15 people in one of those study rooms who are just going at it for the exams, it starts to smell bad and like, <laughs> uh, it's hot. But I think when you're in those rooms, it's like you're really surrounded by people who care about the subject that you're interested in. And you know that they have very different you know, backgrounds. Some of them are journalists or economists, modelers, engineers. But you sort of talk out all the questions that you have raised with this program and you know, go and do your exams and hopefully you do well. That's it. <laughs> Uh, okay, we still have uh, uh, some minutes for questions and answers. Uh, uh, I can. Uh, should we move the this microphone? Yeah. Uh, any any Q, uh, any questions for uh, our panel? Yeah. Hi. Uh, my question is for Lena. Um, do you find yourself sort of constrained by? BP's mandate insofar as maintaining shareholder value for their core oil and gas business in your current role? Um, um, so, you know, I think there have been a few recent headlines on how not only just BP, but the entire oil and gas industry has been making executive pay to emissions. They've also increased um, reporting of emissions also increase the renewable energy portfolio. So action is being taken, and the pressure, oftentimes the pressure is coming from the shareholders because climate change is perceived as being such a big risk. Um, so, you know, things are being done, but of course we'll have people who say it's not enough. But I think it is a process and it's Other questions? Yeah.
any other question? Yeah. Now, I'd be really interested to hear if there's um, anything you didn't learn during your course, where now that you're out in the wide world, you wish, why don't they teach me about that? I really would have liked to have learned something about that. I mean, finance, for example. You're now in finance. We hope we're going to do something about finance over the next year or two. But we didn't teach you, did we, saw about finance. So, so how, how did you pick that up? <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Question. I think uh, it was through actually through working at the World Bank Private Sector Women International Finance Corporation. My mandate was sort of to do a lot of communications on kind of institutions who has a division within the IFC. So basically their goal is to get financial institutions to become more sustainable investors across the region of sustainability, not just in buying the climate related issues. Uh, so that's how I went about finance. And naturally that comes with it, but the World Bank has now set strong targets in terms of its climate and environment related investments. Uh, so learning about how we're creating different funds and private sector windows, sort of risk mitigation uh, financial tools for climate related investments in renewable energy or otherwise. But I guess it's really, like, the doesn't stop in this discussion. Uh, yeah, I guess that's why I want to find it. Thanks. Um, wow. Yeah, I think also as well, I noticed that there's a new course on sort of more developing country perspective. I think that was something that I felt could have been addressed more. I know it was in some courses, but yeah, so I think it's development in Thank you. What about our current students, maybe? Any? Yeah, we have one. Uh, nowadays, a lot of businesses like to call the world stuff sustainable. You see it everywhere. When looking for jobs and looking at work for business, how do you, when you're still at the outside, how do you distinguish, okay, which companies you know, work on truly make sustainable impact and which companies are just putting it on their posts and whatnot? So, like, if you want to make impacts as an individual, how do you make sure you work for a company that's actually really driven by sustainability and not just doing it for the uh, for PR? Um, well, I think it's difficult to really tell from just the outside. Um, on the one hand, you can probably tell individually from their goals and their mission and everything. But I think ultimately it will come from the internal human capital, the internal infrastructure that they would have. And the only way to really know that is to interview with them, um, try and introduce yourself to someone you might know in the company, um, and try and understand how the company works. Because people who just put up posters about you know, recycling have one person that does that. It takes an entire team to actually make it. So that's coming from. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really to all of you. I mean, you're coming in as really the new wave of employees into the workforce with this knowledge and this understanding. How do you feel that your fellow colleagues are in their attitude towards the environment and green issues? You're not directly involved in jobs like yours or doing something. So I work in a very climate-related NGO. So I think, and we're actually based in Bermondsey in a building that's called the Climate Hub. And as well as we have a climate tracker, uh, some aviation-related climate NGOs. And so we're basically surrounded by, and I think for me it's a little bit different because you know, everybody you know, kind of believes. Um, I don't know how that's how is that. Even just in terms of sentiment, do you think people of this 
much more front of their mind in the world of work, regardless of the jobs that they're doing.
do that in some extent. It's for nuance and certifications. So, where does your work slot into that and to like correspond with uh, national or uh, regulatory initiatives? Uh, what the goal is to be affecting policy makers and having them essentially set standards for themselves so they don't have to uh, I think we, I mean, we would all like to work towards one global standard, but there's a lot of local context issues that we often have to come across, right? I mean, uh, what is a just transition in India or China? Is there any different from the other countries that are different from the UK? So, I'd say that we, yeah, we're pushing towards, obviously we'd like everyone to develop our standard, but it's not going to be that easy. And so often we have to look for local proxies or thresholds in different sectors. Uh, but I'd say that we are working like in Brazil, in China, in parts of Africa, so we've helped to issue bonds in Nigeria. And, and Brazil and most of the guys around the The kind of countries that have issued, I say that we help to issue most of those bonds by either advising the policy makers, the issuers, or the investors, or organizing workshops between all of those players so they can go and actually start to build that platform. Thank you. Uh, just, just actually back on the theme of the, the course. The, as the field gets ever bigger and more expansive, Paul's question becomes uh, ever more pressing. Um, but the obvious corollary of that is if there's stuff we're missing out that really should be included, how do we do it? Does that mean uh, more optional modules? Uh, another whole new master's program? Does it mean there are things that were really not so interesting and maybe could be dropped? I suggest we do not have that conversation here, but I'm sure if everyone wants to drop an email to, to Lorenzo or Corbias, uh, I think that could be equally interesting if perhaps they were all done there. Um, but obviously we just can't keep expanding the course to work in ever harder, uh, <laughs> however interesting it might be. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi everyone, um, as you can see, for those of you who were uh, on the course uh, a few years previously, I'm no longer the program leader, I've had over to Lorenzo, so it's one of them to relax. Um, I just wanted to say something really brief, which is that it's, it's apparent from what uh, the others have been saying, that uh, students uh, from multiple years have really started to feel a sense of value of the network of not just their classmates within their year, but the alumni network more broadly. And so I just want to make a plea for those of you who aren't members of the LinkedIn group, uh, please sign up to that and it can become, it's difficult for us to kind of coordinate and work out how best to facilitate that alumni um, group so that you can stay in touch and build links with each other. But I think the LinkedIn group is probably the simplest way of doing that. So uh, if you're not currently signed up to LinkedIn, Please do so, and that can facilitate the linkages, the kinds of environments that we're talking about, that build things across the years and enable you as a community to be useful to each other in your ongoing your careers. So, that's just Thank you very much. Very important for a future uh, alumni event. Um, okay, very well. So, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, participating uh, to our EP <coughs> alumni event. Uh, as always, we will have uh, uh, food and drinks in the reception room, so uh, we are welcoming you in a few minutes there. Bye, thanks. <laughs>